Welcome back to this session uh, today, the second session of day two. And we are, um, I guess, delighted and privileged to have uh, a veritable firepower of uh, um, Queensland statutory appointments joining us today for a couple of talks, one about consent processes in research and one about integrity uh, ethics uh, in research. So um, if Nicola is there, um, I will hand over to Dr. Nicola Stepanov to um, take this session on herself. Hello. Thank you, Gordon. Welcome, everybody. Do we know how many people are tuning in for Susan's session today? Uh, so far, 160. Uh, yesterday, we had over 450. So uh, I'm fairly sure people will be back in the next few minutes. It would be good if we had one of those worms. That'd be very interesting. Um, hello. <laughs> you think? Yeah, just a little bit. You hello. Kind of put me off my game, eh? Already. <laughs> hello, and welcome to the session. If you don't know me, my name's Nicola Stepanov. I'm the Queensland Integrity Commissioner. Um, I've had quite an extensive history within uh, Atrex. I think it extends to to be about two decades long. So, but I'm oh, much younger old. than I look. <laughs> Anyway, thank you for joining us uh, today. We've actually got two sessions that we're going to cover in the next hour and a half. The first session will run for between 10 and 15 minutes, and then the second session will run from, say, 12, 10 to or 12, 15 onwards. And we'll give you some time to answer some or to ask us some questions at the end of each session. So our first session this morning is on how do I enrol a patient into research who potentially cannot provide consent themselves. Um, so joining me today is uh, Ms. Susan Gardner. So Susan is a tribunal member and mediator, and she has a Bachelor of Laws with Honours and also a Master's of Laws with Honours. She's been a barrister at the Supreme Court of Queensland and of the High Court of Australia since 1984, and she's a very experienced mediator and conciliator. Um, she also serves on a number of boards. Now, Susan, back to you in today's topic. Your tribunal work at QCAT is very, very wide-ranging wide mm. across many jurisdictions of QCAT, but you've got this particular special interest in the human rights jurisdiction. I do. Um, and you've got very broad experience in the field of medico legal administration practice and regulation. And for those of you who have not met Susan, Susan also sits on the Metro South uh, Human Research Ethics Committee and has been a member there since oh, ooh, 10 years. Yeah, well, oh, maybe not that long, but certainly five oh. or six, yeah, two, two terms, I think. Yes, it's been it's been quite a while. Mm, six so years, maybe. Mm. Susan's obviously very well placed to um, speak on this topic. And on that note, I will hand over to you, Susan. Well, thank you. Um, I suppose I wanted to talk um, to my colleagues about this because it's surprisingly an issue that comes up in our HREX reasonably frequently. And that is, okay, I've got research that I want to do and some of my patients, sorry, some of my participants um, may not be, be able themselves to give consent. What do I do? Well, before 1998, you couldn't do anything because there was no capacity for um, people who couldn't themselves consent to actually be enrolled. Um, the disability um, sector fairly rightly said, well, that's not all that fair. First of all, um, there may be issues that um, these, these patients have who, and they want to involve themselves in research about the specific uh, condition that they have um, uh, for their own personal satisfaction, but also to contribute to something and you are holding them out from being able to do that. So in 1998, the Powers of Attorney Act got amended um, to allow a substitute decision maker, as it was then called, to be able to consent um, to someone being enrolled in uh, research when they can't themselves um, consent to it. But there were some strings attached. Because these are a vulnerable group of people, um, the Act um, sets out a process that must be first uh, gone through to have the research itself approved. So. There's an overarching application that comes to QCAT to have the research approved. And then after that, um, each patient is individually consented using um, a substitute decision maker. So the law changed a little, changes a little bit from the 30th of November this year, and um, which is remarkably soon. 
So what I wanted to do was just run through how, as a researcher, you might be saying, oh, I've got these people who perhaps can't give consent. I'm not absolutely sure. I want to enrol them in my research. What do I do? So I know that you spent an awful lot of time yesterday talking about capacity, so I'm not going to go through that all again for you. But just to say that generally why patients can't give consent are because they've got a mental illness, they have dementia, they have a drug and alcohol dependency, intellectual disability or an acquired brain injury. They're the, generally the five categories in which people fall who find that they don't give, um, they, they may not have the capacity to give consent. Now, informed consent is matter specific. What do I mean by that? It means that if someone's consent fluctuates, it may be that um, they can, they have capacity to consent to some things, but not to others. For example, they might be able to handle their day-to-day -day finances, but they can't deal with the um, capital investment that they've got. And the same thing goes, goes with um, um, uh, consent to medical research. So I generally suggest that people have um, two questions in mind when they're looking at whether someone can give consent. Um, and the first one being, despite this potential incapacity, can this patient give informed consent to enrol in this specific piece of research? Now, that involves an inquiry. It's not just uh, with nice open-ended questions um, uh, in the normal course of, of uh, you consenting any patient um, that you would consent um, to any medical um, uh, event. But the second part of it is, could this person make an informed consent to withdraw at some point in the future in the future if they wanted to? And again, you're all used to consenting. Um, it's not all that different. You just have to go through a nice open-ended process and please put it in your notes, write it down. Um, remember that the consent itself is the process. It's not the record of it. It's what you do, it's not how you record it, but it is important that you record how you do it. If the answer to both of those parts, or both of those questions is yes, then you don't need to come to QCAT because you have someone who will be themselves able to consent to being enrolled. But if the answer to one of those parts is no, then you have to take the next step. Now, the next step, <clears throat> um, is to bring an application before the tribunal to have the research, what is called approved. Again, sounds terrible, but isn't all that um, hard to do. There is an application form that needs to be filled out. Um, and you will see, if you have a look at the section of the um, Guardianship and Administration Act that's involved, that um, there are set out there a number of things that the tribunal must, and I emphasize the word must, must be satisfied about to be able to approve it as clinical research. And it's section 74A of the Guardianship and Administration Act. Um, have a look at the new act. It's been shifted from the definition section of the current act to the body of the act from the 30th of November. And there is a, um, an integrated act that's up on the Queensland um, legislation website. Um, recently amended, this section actually now includes uh, a trial of devices, um, techniques, biologicals, and something else that I can't remember at this point. Um, so really the easiest way to do it is to decide whether you need to come to QCAT is to simply go through that section and say, am I answering yes to all of these questions? Because if you're answering yes, to um, drugs, devices, biologicals or techniques involving the carrying out of health care, which may include giving placebos to some of the participants. So the, the multi-centred placebo um, trials are also included. Um, then if you can answer yes to all of the questions that are there, then that's something that's going to have to come to QCAT. But if, um, and you'll see that the Act actually requires that, for example, um, it be intended to diagnose, maintain or treat a condition affecting the participants in the research. Now, some of the applications I sometimes get aren't that. For example, uh, a biobank. 
generally isn't intended to diagnose, maintain or treat a, a particular condition affecting the participants. So it may well be that that's not something that you need to come to QCAT for. I can read the Act, you can read the Act. Have a read. If you're answering yes to all of the, all of the, all of the, the musts in 74C, then you've got to come to QCAT. If you're answering no to a number of them, <coughs> then you probably don't have to make an application. If you have any doubt about it, make an application because then I or one of my colleagues can tell you whether you needed to have approval or you didn't. Generally, the application takes about a month to process. We do need to go through the process of getting it and sending you a notice, which is a requirement of the Act. That's just gone off. Um, uh, a requirement of the Act. Thank you. I think we're still there. Good. Um, we're so good um, at technology oh, here. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so the notice goes out. We have to wait seven days because that's a requirement of the Act. Then we actually have the hearing in what's called in chambers. In other words, in our offices, we don't need you to attend. Um, if on the very rare occasion that we want to ask you a question, we'll probably ring you. Um, so generally we try and move them through as quickly as possible. Because I'm a HREX member on Metro South, I don't do any of those applications. One of my other colleagues do, does, but I'm often involved in the others. So you get your approval from QCAT, what then? So you've got some a, pay, um, a participant that you think can't consent themselves and you've got the QCAT approval. How do you actually enrol them so that the data that you get from that particular participant can be used in your research? The answer is you look for a substitute decision maker. Now, how do you find one of those? You probably, again, went through all of this yesterday, but just to remind you, um, there is a hierarchy of, um, of people um, uh, to whom you would turn and they are exactly the same people that you would be looking for if as a clinician you're looking for consent from someone for any other medical procedure. So you're looking for first of all a guardian under um, um, an advanced health directive or sorry um, or a, um, a guardian appointed by the tribunal or an attorney under an enduring power of attorney and if you don't have any of those formal documents, you're looking for a statutory health attorney. Again, there's another hierarchy. So a statutory health attorney is a spouse in a close and continuing um, uh, relationship, um, a person who's a carer for, and you just go down the list till you find one who's appropriate and competent, person who's a carer for the adult who's not a paid carer. Although if you're on a carer's pension, that's not um, considered to be a paid carer. Um, close friend or relative who's not a paid carer, please don't look for a next of kin that doesn't exist in this in this environment. Um, you're looking for a substitute decision maker. You might be looking for next of kin in other areas, but not in this particular part of the world. And then finally, um, for all Queenslanders over 18, if none of the above exist, and sadly for some people they don't, the public guardian is always the substitute decision maker of last resort. How am I going for time? Good. Yep. Um, that's pretty much all I wanted to tell you, uh, except to make just a couple of comments, um, because, as I said, um, this issue of coming um, coming to QCAT comes up reasonably frequently in our HATREX dis um, discussions. It's easy to determine the consent process if everybody is likely to have consent. It's easy to, to determine the consent process if no one's likely to have consent. So if you're talking intubated in ICU or fluctuating dementia or fluctuating mental health, then you're probably going to have to come to QCAT, um, a acquired brain injury, drug and alcohol dependency, all of those things. are. So the two extremes are always fairly easy to pick. It's the grey area in the middle that where you might have a mixture you might have someone with dementia with sundown syndrome, so they're fine in the morning, but they're off with the fairies in the afternoon. Um, so, you know, the, the, their capacity to consent to these things is time specific as well as domain specific. So you just need to, it's that gray area in between and I think tricks um, researchers up. Um, and so what happens is, um, the process is too hard for the researchers, so they just, in reality, only enrol, enrol patients with capacity. 
they might say they're going to have a wider, wider, but they really avoid anyone who looks like they're going to be a problem. Or they didn't know that they had to apply to QCAT in the first place, or they knew and they just ignored it. Now, um, from my point of view, what that means is that these incapacitated um, participants are not allowed to exercise their rights to, re to be represented in the sample group um, and potentially, although I suspect no one's ever taken the point, um, researchers can't add their results to um, the final research tally because they're not approved participants. Um, and on either of those two um, reasons, I think there's um, some genuine unfairness there. So I would just um, uh, advocate that you just think about what you're doing. The forms, the application form is on the website. Um, we try and move them through as quickly as they can, we can for you, because I know how time pressured everyone is, particularly around this time of the year um, with the grants coming out. Um, and um, just give some thought to um, how you want to set it up and give us time to process it if you can. What have I missed? Thank you. I actually don't think you've missed anything. I've kept along with you. Thank okay. you very well. I'm actually going to hand over to Gordon um, for any questions from those who have been tuning in today. Gordon, take it from here. Why? Well, Why? Thank you, Nicola. Um, Susan, a couple of questions, and one that arose last yesterday, a very straightforward one. What is QCAT's turn over time for applications? Well, you're not listening to me. About a month, Gordon, we hope. But it does vary a little bit, um, um, depending on um, how quickly the registry... W once the application comes in, it has to be processed. We have to wait seven days. We have to actually give the what the Act calls the adult, in this case your patient, seven days clear notice before I can do anything with the application. Then it comes down to me, and as soon as I've got time... Um, uh, after that, um, I process it as quickly as I can and get the order out to you. So we we try to get them done within a month because I understand how pressured researchers are, but sometimes um, with just the pressure of work at QCAT, it goes out a bit longer. Thank you for that. Susan, another question. Um, is it possible to separate, say, standard care from the research component? Gordon, so you and you and I have had a discussion about this, have we not? This isn't, this isn't for my benefit, though, Susan, is it? Uh, and I know that you have an application before QCAT at the moment on exactly this point. And oh. I know that I'm probably going to have to write the reasons on that, so I'll just take a deferral on that answer. <laughs> Fair enough, well deferred. Um, and this is the question from the floor. If one has QCAT approval, does this negate the need to get approval for the use of data under the Public Health Act? I don't know the answer to that. Oh, do you know, I, can, I actually can't remember either. I think the best person to ask about that would be um, one of the governance officers at your institution, depending on that, who that is. And for those of you who are tuning in from outside of Queensland, just remember the acts we're speaking about are for the Queensland jurisdiction. So if you're, so familiarise yourself with whatever uh, is available to you in your own jurisdiction. Mm, I should have made that point. Than, Thank you. Yeah, because yeah, it's all Queensland based. Yeah, I just remembered that we might have people tuning in. But from I elsewhere. suspect there'll be equivalent there'll be... sorts of processes in most of the other jurisdictions because Absolutely. although this, these acts of Queensland are state based, there's a, a fair amount of uniformity across yeah. across a number of them. And either your governance officer or your HREC coordinator or someone working within the HREC will have a good idea mm. depending on where. Mm depending on where you are uh, in Australia or overseas, if you've tuned in from overseas. And I may, I may, just, give you a, I may just give you a clue here. Um, obviously, QCAT provides you the opportunity to um, get consent, but clearly you can't use the data unless you have consent to do so. But there is uh, Section 150A of the Hospital and Health Boards Act, um, which again is one of these, um, which states a tribunal under the Guardianship Act or another person authorised under a law to make decision for the participant consents to the participant's participation in research. So I think what that says is you, you can't use it unless you have that, uh, that that's, process. That's certainly been my, my understanding, Gordon, but I, to be honest with you, I don't know how anyone tells that, but anyway. Mm, that's okay. Well, you've yeah. answered your own question. It's perfect. Mm. Well, just, just for your benefit, Nicola and Susan, always here to help. 
<laughs> hey, look what we might do I'll now. remind you of that, Gordon. <laughs> as we, as the production team behind the scenes, and we're obviously not a production team, um, reassemble ourselves for the next panel session. We're just going to sign off for a moment and go, it will go dark at this end, but we'll be back in a second as we usher Alan McSporran into the room and get him to take a seat. Otherwise, it could all get very ugly. So if you're <laughs> online, we'll be back very shortly. Gordon, we'll leave you them in your hands at this point. Well, okay, you, you go play musical chairs then and uh, we'll, I don't know, might have time, might have to put Spotify on again, or maybe not. not you sure. might get time to put an ad in for your sponsors, Gordon. That's right. Well, that's There's all the or bathroom break for uh, well, anyone. I'll tell you what, if you, if you dull your screen, I will do just that. Excellent, thank you. Okay, um, so while we're waiting, let's take the opportunity as suggested by uh, the venerable QCAT member to recognize our sponsors and supporters of this uh, event. Um, of course, Brisbane Diamond Tina Health Partners are sponsoring this event. Um, and we have some supporters in the form of Queensland Government, that being the Department of Health, um, Metro North Hospital and Health Service, um, Salinger Privacy, of whom Andrea Kalea um, conducted a privacy training session yesterday, which was very successful. And of course, uh, through Gary Allen, the Australasian Human Research Ethics Consultancy Services. So thank you to those uh, the sponsors. And at the moment, we have 266 people online uh, listening to the wisdom of our uh, um, panel. So uh, panelists, please come back whenever you are ready. My lips and now all this time it's passing by, but I still can't seem to tell you why it hurts me every time I see you don't realize how much I need you. I Okay, let's hold the Spotify there, but just uh, while we're waiting, just another plug, please, because we have an ethics chair panel tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon. Still looking for some uh, questions for that panel. Um, any big questions you want answered, ones you haven't managed to answer, get answered today, especially potentially around the AI and perhaps even in this session around uh, um, the use of data. Okay, it sounds like uh, the panel might be ready, so I will hand over to them. Hello and welcome. Welcome back. It's our, are we off mute as well? Look at us being technologically a little bit savvy. <laughs> <laughs> just a minute, we're just going to pull a panel member along a bit. You might want to get in the screen. Yeah. It's yeah. No show without punch buttons. That's right. That's right. Hello. Thanks for joining us. If you didn't watch the last session, I'm Nicola Stepanov, the Queensland Integrity Commissioner. We have taken production into our own hands here today, so we apologise if there are any if there are any issues. Um, at the end of this session, which will run to, we'll probably run for about an hour, there'll be time for questions. Uh, and for you to ask a question, uh, I think, I assume Gordon's got a way for you to send questions to him. So I'll hand over to him at that stage. Cool. Apologies for any technological issues that we have in the interim. So welcome to our panel session today on misconduct in research, ethics, integrity, and we're also discussing some practical approaches. Joining me today, we've got Susan Gardner, Alan McSporran, and David Lavelle, and I'll introduce them all a little bit later as we get along a bit further. So um, as we know, research misconduct is not a new phenomenon, and according to the literature, uh, it's becoming something that's more common. It was first cited in the literature back in the 1830s, and I was just reading an article uh, only recently by Raman and Ankia, and they were talking about this idea of um, uh, dishonesty and research misconduct within the medical field. So that was a very, very long time ago. Of course, as it's such a competitive environment, research misconduct has become more pronounced. The kinds of things that we would typically see are things like uh, misrepresentation of data. And of course, we all know about the um, egregious false research of the UK paediatrician, Andrew Wakefield, and he published the false data on the measles, mumps and rubella vaccine. That was published in The Lancet back in 1998, and it took until 2010 for The Lancet to uh, retract that information. Um, Andrew Wakefield obviously is a bit of a celebrity these days because he's dating a very well-known supermodel. Anyway, so that's what happens when you 
do that's another, research another, misconduct, another you go on to date. Step, isn't it? <laughs> I know. It's all very interesting. So in Australia, the key national document that lays out the expected standards of codes is called the Australian Code of Responsible Conduct in Research. We just refer to it as the Australian Code. And you've got bodies like the NHMRC or the ARC who can suspend and withdraw funding if their concerns about uh, research misconduct. Uh, and also the institutions have uh, various rights and obligations as well. However, the ability to take action when you see research misconduct is not confined to just those agencies. Um, and typically any type of conduct in research falls along a spectrum. So we've got the perfect, the perfect researchers at one end who uh, behave very well and they are very committed to, to seeing out their obligations to the HREC or their the governing institute in that regard. And down the other end of the spectrum, we've got those researchers and it, hopefully it is the very small minority who might be inclined towards criminality or to falsely misrepresent uh, what they're doing and how they're spending their money. So when we talk about conduct and research, we're talking about a spectrum. And our panel today is, is going to cover the spectrum of, of misconduct. So we'll have everything from um, some of the, the more minor issues that might arise in relation to misconduct, right up to issues that could come within the jurisdiction of the Crime and Corruption Commission. So Alan, glad you're here today. Thank you. So in Queensland, the Crime and Corruption Commission set a precedent for researchers to be prosecuted for fraud and attempted fraud, and it also included in relation to fabricating results and applications. So Alan, I'm going to start with you, but first I'm going to introduce you. So you're the chairperson of the, the Crime and Corruption Commission here in Queensland. For those of you who don't know about our, we call it the Triple C, um, it's actually the independent statutory body set up to combat and reduce the incidence of major crime and corruption in the public sector in Queensland. So they have very broad oversight, including uh, things like protecting witnesses, surveillance, et cetera. Now, Alan, you were actually admitted as a barrister back in 1970. I shouldn't say back in. I'll just well, say in. <laughs> Alan was in. Admitted in 1978, we don't reference back, anything back to the future. Uh, he was appointed as a senior counsellor in 2005 and then Queen's Council in 2013, so 38 plus years, mm -hmm. Alan, yeah. prior to joining the Triple C. Plus <laughs> This is all you're good for now, we have That's to right. roll you out. <laughs> Uh, so prior to joining this Triple C, Alan worked as a Crown Prosecutor and worked on coronial inquests and commissions of inquiry. So Alan, very broad and impressive skill base there. And we've got a few questions for you today. Now, when we're speaking about the Triple C investigation, it's this one here, and you can find <coughs> it on the Crime and Corruption Commission website under their publications. So Alan, can you tell us more about the Triple C investigation and what kind of conduct the researcher engaged in and why do you think they might have done that? Sure, well, there's a, as you, you say, we published a, a case study on it, and somewhere in there is what I'm referring to now. It's very succinct, I think, but gives a good flavour of what it was all about. Now, the preface is by saying that there had been a tendency in Australia, particularly, to treat this sort of behaviour only as uh, misconduct, breach of the relevant code of conduct, and so forth, and to deal with it internally and then uh, forget yeah, about it, um, to it under the carpet effectively. Mm -hmm. For obvious reasons when you think about it because it, it has enormous impact on reputations and careers but um, to their credit the University of Queensland referred it to us we referred it back for investigation and saw it as being serious enough to pursue uh, criminally which we did essentially uh, in 2016 Dr Bruce uh, Murdoch and Dr Carolyn Barwood both former employees of the University of Queensland were convicted of fraud and attempted fraud their prosecution was a result of an internal investigation by uh, the research uh, for, for research misconduct by UQ and a subsequent criminal investigation by us. The investigation arose from publication of an article purporting to discuss the outcomes of research involving patients suffering from Parkinson's disease. In fact, the research had never been conducted and the article's comments, contents were fabricated entirely, including uh, fabricating um, patient consents to be part of the trial, uh, forged uh, research uh, outcomes. It was just a, a very clumsy in its own way, but very arrogantly uh, perpetrated. They used the article as supporting evidence for their attempts to obtain further grant funding and professional advancement. Once the fraud was discovered, UQ was obliged to take extensive remedial and preventative action 
They had to retrospectively review and retract articles authored by Murdoch and Barwood, repay grant funds, cancel funding applications already approved, withdraw other applications already submitted, and conduct a major review of their research and financial operations and processes. So you can see what a, what a huge impact it had. And um, the sentencing uh, uh, judge took uh, the matter very seriously, and both of them, that is uh, Murdoch and Barwood, um, who'd resigned, I might say, from UQ and, and couldn't be dealt with internally in a disciplinary sense because they'd resigned, but pleaded guilty and narrowly escaped jail. They were both um, uh, sentenced to suspended uh, imprisonment. Um, so that is a pretty fair indication of how serious it was. It's the first time it's ever been prosecuted in Australia, although it's quite common in the UK and US. And I think now it'll be more common here, Frank, because I think the, there's recognition now that uh, the consequences of this sort of behaviour are pretty serious. Mm. I and mean, just for example, the research was into, as I say, Parkinson's disease. There are many uh, poor individuals who are sufferers and who had their expectations falsely raised by the outcome of this research, which was complete, complete fabrication. So it, it, there's that aspect, there's the undermining of the reputation of the UQ, which has a, a pristine, otherwise reputation, well regarded. So um, quite apart from the loss of their careers, which was justified, um, it, it, it will take the university many, many years to regain their credibility in this area. It's a really interesting point, um, Alan, particularly when you think about, so most of health practice, including medical practice, is based on evidence-based medicine or, or at least have an, has an evidence base. So you're seeing clinicians who are relying on the, the veracity of the data that they see in the literature that they read to make decisions about patient care. And certainly with Andrew Wakefield, we've seen that whole measles, mumps, rubella, and that, you know, a lot of parents not wanting to get their children vaccinated over a couple of these last decades simply because of an article like that. Um, so it does have a very uh, significant effect on um, the, the, just the way that we practice healthcare um, generally. Yeah. So with this kind of research misconduct, what, why does the triple C get involved? Is it really that sort of public interest test and also concern about public risk? I think it is. I mean, I think I think this sort of behaviour is serious enough to uh, be dealt with by us in conjunction with the university involved, as it has happened in this case, because it's no longer to be uh, considered to be something that just can be dealt with internally. Careers go on, reputations aren't damaged unduly, it doesn't hit the media. I think this sort of behaviour needs to be called out as a deterrent in the public interest to stop the behaviour uh, happening in the first place. Mm. When you look at how this actually uh, was brought to light, it was just uh, through some other staff member noticing that the paper, its details about the research, didn't match the logging details for lab. The lab wasn't big enough to cater for the same number of patients purportedly involved in the trial. And as it turned out, uh, the lead researcher, uh, Murdoch, was on leave for a lot of the time he claimed to be doing the research. So it was just blatant. Mm -hmm. And luckily this person raised their concerns and it was then uh, followed up and uh, pursued. But as I say, the blinding arrogance of that tells me that it might have been going on for a long time um, and there was no need to be particularly deceptive about it, mm. get away with it. So I think it's serious, yeah. I remember uh, myself marking a master's thesis quite a long time ago and at that stage I had been doing a lot of um, end of life and cancer research and the thesis I was marking, they were using the, the names of um, publishers in the oncology field and basically where where the pub where the particular author's paper would discuss oncology and its statistics they switched oncology out for arthritis and it was only because i was very familiar with the authors in the field that i was aware that they every single publication was actually an oncology publication and they were putting it forward to get a master's award um, mm -hmm. as if it was arthritis, something like that could go on to, to um, impact on the care of a patient. Mm -hmm. So if we're thinking about the kinds of things that end up with the Crime and Corruption Commission or a similar body in Australia, what, what kinds of convictions or penalties might these researchers be facing? Well, I think in this case, um, as I said, the, the court considered it to be serious enough to otherwise impose a prison sentence which carries with it an automatic conviction, which is quite serious view, looking at international travel and so forth. And secondly, uh, it was just, uh, they, they evaded actual, actual custody by a whisker. The, the sentence of imprisonment was suspended, so it didn't actually go to jail, mm. 
but the message is, you know, this is pretty bad conduct. Yeah. And, and for all the obvious reasons, really, um, you know, just a blatant um, use of the fraud to get money from um, people who are funding this sort of research in, in good faith, yeah. including, I think one of them was the Lions Club, you know, weren't flush with funds, but they thought they'd give them $20,000 to kick off some research based on this great work that these two had done, which was just a fraud. Yeah. So um, they had to repay those monies. The university had to repay the, uh, the Lions and so forth. There are much greater sums of money they'd actually applied for, but the university withdrew when the fraud was discovered rather than let it go through. Mm. Several hundred thousand dollars worth of uh, grants. And, you know, it's all born out of this huge pressure to publish or perish. Mm, that's you, know, right. you have to that's back right. up your research with these papers. If you don't, your currency, your employment might be at risk, your, your relevance to the area of research might be diminished. Mm. So there, there's a huge temptation, not that it justifies it. You can see the reason behind why people yeah. cross the line. And of course, in doing so, you ruin not only your own career, but you send a shocking message to people who are funding these things to say, well, you know, should I be putting money into this? How do I know it's legitimate? Mm -hmm. Look at these people who I thought were, you know, senior people, professor mm -hmm. and doctor. And it was just a, um, a tissue of lies. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very bad outcome, um, frankly. And I think everyone's sort of stepping back now thinking, well, we just need to get more careful about these projects tick the boxes and do a bit more um, governance around them to make sure it's legitimate, yeah. which puts even more pressure on the researchers mm -hmm. who are doing it legitimately. Yeah. And that's the shame because, as we said in our report um, publicly, we had a disclaimer right on the uh, start of the report to say, look, don't um, lump UQ into all of this. These two individuals are the only two involved. The other people in the department were all doing their job appropriately and uh, in a dedicated way. So we had to go out of our way to make sure that the everyone wasn't tired with this shocking brush. Mm. But of course, people will draw the dots, you know, that's and get right. two and two get five, and that's very hard to overcome. Mm. Reputational damage is very, very easily to occur, very, very hard to unwind, and that's mm. that's a terrible consequence. Now, David, great segue from Alan. Mm. There, we were speaking about UQ, probably not in the. the the best terms, but you've gone on to, to do a lot of work in that field. So for those of you joining us, David's the Associate Director of Integrity Investigations Unit at the University of Queensland. You've been there since 2012. Yeah. I think, look at me throwing dates around like we're all getting old. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. On that note, so the Integrity Investigations Unit is an independent work group that reports to the Chief Operating Officer the Senate Risk Committee and also the Vice Chancellor's Risk and Compliance Committee. Now, David, in the past, you've actually worked as a Detective Senior Sergeant, including as the Officer in Charge of Proceeds of Crime Unit of a major fraud investigations group. So you're probably the perfect person to have <laughs> sort of been dealing uh, with the, the Triple C investigation in this place. So I've got some questions for you now, mm. David. So why is research mixed conduct at times considered to be more than just a breach of a code or a policy? Well, that's a good question. And, and Alan alluded to it before that, you know, I think previously in the in the sector, breaches of, um, you know, the Australian Code for the Responsible Conduct of Research would be considered to be just that, a breach of a code, breach of a code of conduct, for example, the organisation. Mm -hmm. But in reality, when um, fraudulent behaviour occurs, if um, uh, results are fabricated and then they're used for personal gains, such as papers, citations, um, applications for funding, whether it be from the ARC, NHMRC, NCRIS, any of the other funding bodies, uh, then all of a sudden you've got a fraud. It's not just a breach of a policy. And if, uh, if that happens in an entity which has um, um, oversight of the Triple C, as University of Queensland does, it's a corrupt conduct matter. It has to be referred immediately and you have to take great care. So um, and in the Murdoch case, is, case in point, I was involved in that. Um, and there was a lot of work done uh, before we actually went to the Triple C because it was such a new thing. I don't think the Triple C ever faced yeah. that. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember specifically the briefing we gave. Um, there was a room full of people. I think we were there for about four hours just talking about it. So mm -hmm. significant was it? Um, but it did become very apparent to me that ag agencies like um, universities probably weren't thinking that these things could actually be criminal offences. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So what are the implications if you if you sort of fail to pick up on the red flags? And what are the red flags that you might see in your position? Yeah. Or even for a hatred, what would they see? 
Well, the, the, again, the Murdoch case is, is there's not a better case in Queensland to talk about. And um, the things that became very apparent there was, as Alan said, the consent forms. So uh, they were fraudulent and we had two sets of them. So it, it, for me, being an ex-detective, I had the advantage over others that I could actually see without being an expert in handwriting, that there were significant differences in the handwriting styles. So we actually paid quite a bit of money to actually go to a handwriting expert mm. and tell us what we thought, because as you'd be aware, particularly people who are listening, the rules about publishing say that you must retain your data for five years from the date of the published article, but there was no data. So could it be alleged later on that Murdoch was treated unfairly because the data is available, we just didn't find it. So the handwriting really put that to bed. And the handwriting analysis actually came back and said they are forgeries. The question about whether or not data exists was fairly well removed. Um, another one of the red flags that became um, critical was the ethics permit itself. Mm -hmm. So the ethics permit could not be produced um, in, a, in a timely fashion. When it was produced, it was from an overseas university. <laughs> there were clear errors on it. it. To the untrained eye, you, you may look at it and go, okay, there's an ethics permit. But to anyone that's involved in investigations, you would look at it and go, this does not look right. And sure enough, it was a fabrication. The ethics permit was a fabrication. Mm. And so you, you no doubt hear that those that don't know about the Murdoch case are probably hearing about lots of fabrication going on here. Mm. It's not just about the fabricated results. Now, this went into a, um, a very prestigious journal called the European Journal of Neurology. And once that occurs, there's a level of um, uh, authority with that, that people can use that paper. They can use it themselves, as you said, Alan, to, to attach to grant applications. Mm -hmm. It bolsters someone's resume. Mm -hmm. It can get them moving along in their career. Mm -hmm. However, um, through due diligence within the University of Queensland, we knew we couldn't allow um, rumours to spread without unpacking it properly. The handwriting evidence was very critical. But some of the things that occurred, if you look at the timeline of the events, there were actions taken at intervals, which had the University of Queensland been um, more aware of the, the mm. risks, we may have been able to get in front of that a bit earlier. Mm. Uh, and it's some sometimes of, hard to pick though, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's particularly if you're sitting in a hay track and you've got 30 applications on a mm. Tuesday night, you know, starting at five o'clock. Mm. Um, you, you've really got to, mm. you've really got to be on the ball. Yeah. Well, I think the other, the other problem is that human nature being what it is, thankfully, in many ways, people don't want to think of the worst of other people. I mean, especially mm -hmm. someone like a professor and a doctor mm -hmm. who are submitting the application to look on the face of it. Why would you say that they're doing anything other than yeah. bona fide they research? What they say they're going to do. And, yeah. and then you feel almost uh, embarrassed at asking questions about the authenticity of certain aspects. You know, it's a bit mm -hmm. confrontational. But I think you just have to be... You have to be objective and, and fairly clinical about it and just mm. look for the red flags that David's talking about. Not easy to spot, I agree, mm. but you do need to just be careful and have a protocol where you do ask those difficult questions. Yeah. Because and, to, and, yeah. otherwise you're dropping the ball and you're putting at risk a much greater um, outcome. Mm. And that's, know, the advantage of, that's the advantage of a mixed HREX group. Absolutely. Because, because yeah. the bits that I can see as a lawyer as opposed to the bits that some of my colleagues who are, you know, ingrained, experienced researchers, they can say, oh, that's not right, and I can say, I don't know what you're talking about, explain it to me. Mm. Or, and, you know, the the, the um, outcome is greater than the individuals often. Mm. But, right. yes, I agree, the independence. I mean, what's it? if this comes back to a hatrix, all they can do is just remove the approval. Yeah. Mm. I mean, yeah. that's that's it. Yeah, yeah. So and normally they'll here, work in with governance too, yeah. and governance will remove its approvals. Yeah. Mm. I thought here one of the one of the major flags, without knowing the setup at UQ and the labs and so forth, is this person who blew the whistle ultimately said that there's just no way that number of people could have been involved in the trial at that lab. It just wasn't big enough. Yeah. And the machine that was supposedly used wasn't something he was qualified or um, familiar with to use. Yeah. So little things like that that people have to have their radar up. Yeah. You know. Because yep. some of these people just are just so arrogant and uh, don't don't even think the be question about it. No, yeah. if you need to. Yeah. And I think within the Atrex as well. So everyone brings a different expertise. But if anyone from Townsville Atrex is on board, hello. Um, but 
as they would know, when we had issues, it would be to say a clinician raising a red flag and saying, look, these researchers have cited these particular side effects and these are not, they haven't cited the more serious side effects. Or it could be that the, the timeframes or the, the number of patients that, that they were seeking to enrol in a trial aren't correct. Or in some cases, it has been that when they've reported side effects, they haven't reported them accurately. So I think have, when you have a HREC look at those applications and everyone has that ability to provide input, I think that's really important. Now for you, David, and for UQ, what kind of impacts did you experience at UQ from this research misconduct? Because it was very, very public. Well, it was, and, and you know, Alan sort of opened the door um, to talk about that a bit further. Um, you can imagine if it was in your work area, how you would feel of someone that's been previously revered, a former head of school, uh, highly decorated, um, had been interviewed by um, a current affair, one of those programs, on um, the uh, initial success of um, uh, the process was called um, rapid transcranial magnetic stimulation. And it was designed to actually assist people that have got speech issues because of things like Parkinson's or stroke. Mm. Um, and so we've got Parkinson's Queensland involved in, in funding it. We've got Lions involved in funding it. And as research, um, as the way op the operations of research go, you've got many people involved. You know, there are, there are many authors of papers mm. and there are many people who will benefit um, from grants. Um, they will continue to be employed, for example. So all of a sudden we've got question marks on so many papers. Mm. Um, and I, I must give due credit to um, Professor Peter Koopman and, and Dr. Susan O'Brien from the university who did the very, very hard work of coming up with a decision tree, which was very cleverly put together to try and figure out how many papers actually should be considered out of a list of 300 papers. Mm. Um, and of course, while all that's going on, the, um, the impact it has on people's emotions, mm. you know, human beings that have worked closely with, you know, revered academics and suddenly question um, everything. Everything, mm. yeah. And it's, it's sad to watch mm. that good people who question so much that, mm. you know, don't deserve to have to go through that. Yeah. And then there's a the reputation piece. But, you know, I must say the university handled it really well. Um, former Vice Chancellor Peter Hoy was determined that it would not stand for this and made bold statements about it, so that was to his credit. And, you know, where we've come now um, from this journey has been quite extraordinary. Um, and we've recently been through an audit process that the Triple C. Um, oddly enough, the actual audit um, parameters were set by the Murdoch matter itself. So rather ironic. Um, it's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Now, we've been talking about, so as I said before, we've got this researcher conduct in general is on a spectrum. So when you hit that halfway point and you're sliding down to the dark edges, right at that pointy end, we're probably going to hit Alan McSporran and the Crime and Corruption Commission if you're in Queensland or a similar body or agency mm. if you're in a different jurisdiction. But, Susan, mm. there's actually a place there for that QCAT can get involved if there's a concern about research and misconduct. Oh. So what kind of conduct might that be and what role does QCAT play? QCAT has a peripheral role um, because the jurisdiction covers um, the bodies that are covered by APRA mm. and they tend to be medical or medical, well, apart from, well, I shouldn't say apart from Chinese medicine, but um, they tend to cover the spectrum of people who are registered as, as health practitioners. Now, if they're registered as health practitioners and either the health ombudsman or um, um, is the other, oh. APRA themselves, the medical board, they can refer disciplinary matters to QCAT um, or they can be reviewed if they make the decision themselves and there can be um, sanctions, fines, there can be conditions put on um, a, a registration. Um, um, you know, there are a number of possible outcomes. Um, we don't send them to jail generally, but sometimes you might think about <laughs> it. Um, but, but no, I mean, uh, and to be honest, the sorts of things that we normally see are, I say run of the mill in inverted commas, um, inappropriate conduct or drug misuse. That's sort of you know, the range of it. I could only find one decision in the QCAT published decisions that even vaguely talks about um, um, 
clinical research, and that was the question. Uh, that was a decision of the medical board and Philip Bird, uh, and it's um, um, and it does refer. The original referral involved a disciplinary ground that arose out of professional misconduct because of clinical research. But it really, and it was um, for the use of low dose dilantin and or epilim over a period from 2006 to 2012. But it wasn't, it wasn't um, traversed in any great way in, in the decision itself. And apart from um, Dr. McBride's seminal um, meltdown in New South Wales um, in what, 2019, I think, no. Oh, gee, 1994 now. Oh, sorry. Oh, that's that's bad. And that is is a big decision. And really, that's that. In many ways, that's a seminal decision for professional misconduct across Australia. So McBride and Bert, and that's about it in Queensland. And I think the reason is because um, they need to have some sort of health professional registration. Yeah. Now, um, so really, what else? So we're fairly marginal. what else? Well, HATREC can a HATREC committee can um, withdraw approval, um, and in fact, the sort of orders that I make in cl- in approving clinical research are three years or until um, the um, the approval is withdrawn, whichever mm-hmm. happens first. Um, otherwise, it's the reputational stuff. It's uh, it's processes through the university itself. That's about it. Yeah. I think that highlights how important it is for institutions and universities to have a very strict and able governance system in place mm. because they're the ones that suffer the most harm mm. and they and they're the first line of defence. So it gets past them, you know, like this one, it has all sorts of implications, mm. uh, which are hard to unwind. But if the university has has now a great set of protocols and on the lookout this sort of stuff, that should be the that should be the experiment. Mm. You know, otherwise it's uh, you find catch up all the time. I think you think there's something to be said about the role of the, particularly for the PhD students, the role of the supervisors and all mm. of this. Because I don't think I'm speaking out of turn when I say a common comment that comes up in the Hatrex committee meetings that we have is, do you really think the supervisor read this? Yeah, that's true. I think every Hatrex member would would say that. And also, so we have our universities conducting research, um, but we also have our hospital within the hospital and health services as well with those clinician researchers, because it is even getting a job as a clinician now and wanting to progress up through the ranks. It's extremely competitive and you will have um, hospitals and health services looking at, you know, do they have a research track record? Um, So there is that intense focus now. It's very difficult. Absolutely. And it's completely different from what may have occurred years ago, even in the university setting where there there may have been more of a focus on your teaching credentials. Well, see, now that's changed. That teaching and learning, I think the research side of things, because it's yeah, income driven, is, is much more important to universities yeah. um, than um, teaching and learning. Yeah. Yes, and this is from someone who's, you know, just just done a Zoom on, on my late husband's um, teaching and learning award. I think things have changed. Yeah. And exactly. I mean, being when we're thinking about university rankings, we're really thinking about Money. research rankings Money. and yeah. how many publications mm. we've got in sort of different it's prestigious small. journals. Yeah. Well, the other thing to note about this is that there's a real lesson for people involved in research. Von, von Barwood, who was a PhD student, she, was, she discovered she was nominated by him, the professor, as a co-author. Knew she hadn't been, and just then just went along with it. And the pressure on students yeah. and mm. underlings to toe the line and not expose their well, it's bosses. The power exactly, it's exactly. It's exactly. It's a, a cultural huge thing. Power yeah. imbalance. Yeah. And of course, once you go along with that, you are forever compromised. Mm. Yeah. So you know it's a very slippery slope. So I think it's worth. And I'm sure the universities are doing it now. Um, I know they've, they've engaged me for law students for this very purpose. You, you have to send the message that, you know, you should report misconduct. Mm. Oh, what if I lose my job that I spent two years getting a hold of? Yeah. Mm. Well, and I won't get a reference. Well, um, how good it, on your CV would be a question, why didn't you get a reference from your last employer? Oh, I reported them for misconduct or fraud. Mm. How good's that, you know? But that's not the first thing you think about mm. when you're being compromised. Particularly when you're a, an early graduate and you're trying to you know, make your mark. Very hard, and hard and harder by the day. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah. just come back to your question that made about the red flag. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of our very senior people on a, a question of an ethics permit once a discussion. We had some senior lawyers in the in the room, and it was a pleasure to be there to hear the open conversation and <laughs> transparency around these top, these tricky yeah. issues. And, and the comment was made by a you know very senior person. When we discover a problem in research, we must stop. We have a good look at it. We don't start again until we're pretty satisfied it's okay. Mm. And I've, I've, I've never forgotten that. That's it's a great straight. Statement. It is common sense. Yep. You yeah. have some very long hatrex meetings, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But you're right, you don't overthink it. You just do what's inherently correct. You know, you want to know if this is right before you let take the brakes off. Mm. Yeah. Forget about the you know, the time constraints and the pressures. I mean, you've got to get that right, otherwise disaster mm. will befall the whole program. And I know certainly my experience on Hatrex and and anyone who's tuning in who's been on a Hatrex, you know what pressure mm -hmm. they, they're put under, whether it's the chairs or the, the governance officers or the Hatrex coordinators to to push through research and mm -hmm. it's seen as a failing mm -hmm. if it's not passed the first time. I I write things all the time and they're rarely at their best the very first time. So I think mm -hmm. we need to accept that that we need to let Hatrex and governance um Officers do do their work. They're entitled to do their work, and doing research isn't an entitlement. It's a privilege, and we're doing it with on people, and it can affect them. So we we ought to treat it that way. Gordon knows I harp on about that as I have for but years. But it's, it's one of it's one of the strengths of the whole process that it is an independent body. Absolutely, and we, we we're not part of mm. any of the organisations you know, that we're outside. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay, Gordon. I can see apparently we've got quite a few questions. So over to you. Well, thank you, Nicola. Well, there's actually quite a bit of discussion as opposed to questions, but we do have some. So first of all, David, I'd like to take you back to uh, um, somewhere around 2009 to 2011, where the NHMRC did a wonderful bit of work to look at uh, auditing of uh, a number of processes in universities, group of eights, I might add, um, and I know a lot about this because I did it. Um, but the point is, at that time, <laughs> Uh, it wasn't that much. <laughs> yes, you got it. At that time, there wasn't that much in the way of uh, structure. So, how have um, since your time there, what sort of structure have you been able to put in place um, at the university to ensure that uh, things move forward in accordance with um, legislation? Good practice. Yes. Well, actually, uh, a lot, uh, Gordon. Good question. Um, uh, Clearly, one of the things that all organisations need of any size that do a lot of research is research management database. So that's uh, a current project which is nearing completion. The All of the ethics committees have been reorganised completely with new structures in place, um, new policy uh, procedures around the entire research endeavour. Um, in terms of complaints management, there's uh, an Office of Research Integrity now established which reports to the Pro Vice Chancellor of Research. Um, my is my unit with a direct reporting line to the VC Chancellor and um, other senior, you know, senior committees, and um, a clear assessment path for both research misconduct matters and more generic type of misconduct, which could be corrupt conduct matters. I know that's not a lot of information, but it's high level. It's a big, big question. I, th I think, David, it, it, thank you for that. It's very important, and I, I will say. Um, I think it was very commendable that UQ actually took some of these matters forward um, because I think there has been some reticence on the part of educational institutions, perhaps not to, you know, potentially um, sully their, their good names. So I think UQ did a great job there and, and should be commended. Um, Alan, one for yourself. Now, mm -hmm. um, David, you mentioned that UQ had just been subject to an audit. Alan, how can you be certain through the Triple C that um, uh, entities are meeting your requirements. Do you have a structured audit program and what do you look at? We do. I can't personally, Gordon, give you the detail of that because I'm not across it at my level. But um, I think part of the process, we have a structured uh, program of auditing. We have a very good relationship with universities and I think it's a lot to do with that relationship, that trust and that uh, ability to ask the difficult questions and be, uh, be satisfied you're getting the correct information. And, but not taking that at just face value, but, have, but that fits into the program and is a fairly important part of it. And I think um, we got uh, particular comfort, the reasons you just mentioned, that uh, UQ had handled this 
problem extremely well. I mean, the temptation, as you say, always is to protect the business model and reputation rather than be transparent and accountable. And I think, I mean, I believe, as, as David does and as Peter Hoy at the time as Vice Chancellor believed, that the, the best um, medicine is uh, absolute transparency and be seen to be exposing it and more particularly doing something about it in the appropriate way. So that gave us confidence. Uh, we got the report internally from UQ. We were very satisfied with the thoroughness of their investigation. And all of this feeds into our, our audit program, which rates that sort of behaviour and the assurance we can get from the audit program we conduct. And that will vary across uh, agencies. I mean, UQ is a very uh, good partner of ours. Some are not. And we, we are rightly suspicious of some of the responses we get. And that's part of our job, of course. Yeah. And, and I may say, I think from, from reviewing the group of eight, that there was a lot of difference in, in the way things occurred. Not necessarily, be, uh, not, not best practice, just different ways of doing things. But the question is whether that lends itself to finding things which may not otherwise be able to be found. Um, so another question for the panel. Um, in, in terms of complaints raised by research participants or members of the public, does the panel have any comments or insights about cases and how this has been managed? I have a lot, but I'm probably not able to speak about them. <laughs> um, so the, the ones that have come from members of the public have have usually do they, do they come to you or do they they would go to, to an atrec chair or the ombudsman perhaps? no not usually so normally the complaint okay. would come in via the atrec the chair or the governance um, whoever's in charge of governance uh, would receive a complaint so the hospital would get one and the kinds of things might be um where a research participant is talking about some of the things that has have happened to them and it doesn't seem to make sense um, and it could, you know, whether they're being put in examination gowns that are too short, um, just some very strange things. Not to look at your toes. No, that's right, not to look at their toes. Or uh, it might be that a health professional that is in charge of recruiting, uh, a participant might make a complaint to them about things that they're hearing that other participants have been made to do. That, and they are aware that that's not consistent with what the study is all about. Uh, and just, I think this, just generally those kinds of things, it might be a patient, a participant makes a complaint because they haven't provided consent and they've received a phone call after leaving hospital mm. for you know, mm. retrospective mm. consent and they had no idea that they had been enrolled in a study. So they, they come in in very different ways and often... If it's a participant, they, they're not really aware of what has happened to them and whether anything wrong has happened to them as well. And you see that for the more think, junior yeah. staff because they're not really sure what they're looking at. I think what's really important with that is that the HATREC looks at the consenting process and how people are going to be approached and what information they're given and the yeah. power imbalance between the clinicians sitting in a... In a um, uh, what do you call them when they come along to a clinic, like, thank like you, a clinic and say, oh, by the way, we've got this, I'm, I'm the lead investigator yeah. in this project and we, we want to enroll so you. you. And the poor old patient sitting there looking at the, the treating doctor thinking, how do I say no to that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's the power imbalance but also the cold calling. I know we spend a lot of time talking about making sure people have sufficient information. A good PICF that, you know, isn't any more than two pages and explains in, in simple terms what's going yeah, on yeah. at the appropriate um, at the appropriate reading level. These are the sorts of things that HATREC should be looking at. Yeah. And because, you know, ultimately what do you do? You have another researcher who, who writes a peer paper who says, look, this is all just, you know, nonsense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I, if I could just ask you to differentiate here, so a question for you. Obviously, with a participant in research, uh, and, and let's just say it's a clinician that's at fault. Um, and you mentioned earlier talking about uh, APRA and the medical board coming to QCAT. So where is the differentiation then between, say, going to the HWIC and perhaps making a complaint to the ombudsman, which may eventually go to Q, uh, QCAT in that regard? Well, it's really a matter of the legislation. I mean, I, I would have thought within the hospital system, the first port of call would be back to the HATREC. Mm. We could then re-examine it and decide whether they want to pull the approval. Um, that would stop the stop the research in its tracks theoretically. But if it goes further and it becomes 
you know, a serious problem, even at the minor end. Um, the ombudsman um, has a role uh, and can either make a determination themselves or send it on to QCAT for the determination. Mm -hmm. So it depends how far you want to kick the can down the road, really, and what to what level you want to take the complaint. And they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. So you might have someone that makes a complaint to a hospital or an ATREC at the same time they might also be making if it involves the clinician they might also be making a complaint to the health ombudsman and the ombudsman has a number of, of, of things that they can do they can they can mediate they can consult they don't necessarily they can try and problem mm. solve they don't necessarily just take it straight to kick yeah. they will try and deal with it themselves and come up with a, an outcome that suits everybody I think the critically important thing uh, Gordon is is to have a culture uh, that applies across the board to all all people, participants, researchers, assistants, and so forth. Everyone involved in the process understands that if they perceive that something's not quite right, for whatever reason, they should feel able to report it. So, because if you don't have that culture, you don't get started until it's too late. There's a much bigger mess, and it's very hard mm. to unwind. Mm. So that culture of just querying. The sort of things you come to that, that Nicole was talking about that just don't feel quite right. You need to have the ability and understand that you've been encouraged to report it, talk about it, not not conceal it, not be worried about it, be stressed about what the consequences might be, just to be able to talk about it. And if you do, you won't be harassed and bullied. You'll be supported as having done the right thing. Mm. I mean, that's a task, but that's what you need to achieve. But there. feeding into that is the culture of so many of the research People, um, pieces are staff on staff research, yeah, you know, exactly. um, uh, or you know, you you want you're, you're asking your colleagues yet again to become a dis participant. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, so those it's the power imbalances yeah. that you really have to be careful of. Exactly. Yeah. Or it might be that you're a clinician and you're you're dealing with a population that's very vulnerable, mm. could be oncology patients, or yeah. so we've got to respect a person's right to be involved in research, so irrespective of yeah. what they've got, but then also their right to to say no and not be concerned that the treatment options will be changed yeah. Yeah. Um, if they don't agree to to take part in research. There is a, you know, there's a good point, Nicola, and, and that is that so at the Royal, in fact, we have implemented a research integrity process. And of course, culturally speaking, the challenge is making sure it's um, disseminated a, a, across all levels. But then it's also about ensuring that participants understand their rights and the research integrity process. So I guess the question is, how does one manage that? I can see that you can do a sort of top down, bottom up with respect to staff, but then how do you do it with respect to participants to let them know what they can do about it? I think those fact sheets that you well, yeah, you, give, you, about. you give them the PICF in plain yeah. English that's yeah. not 35 pages from a multinational, yeah. you, or you ask them to put an executive summary up front and you give people time to take it away and have a think about it and that's then crucial. decide and you don't stick it under their nose and say oh we want you to do this please sign here so it's really time to process mm. particularly with someone who's vulnerable um and offer you know for someone and these are i suppose where the research people come in to walk them through because mm. as i said perhaps in the earlier discussion consenting is, is the process it's not signing the bit of paper mm. the bit of paper is just a form of evidence of mm. the fact that you've been through a consenting process and the process itself mm is what you have to get right. Yeah. Yeah. I also think the attitude that the hospital might bring to research. So on one hand, you, you will have a small minority of the, the staff who think that, particularly public hospitals, the patients are public patients and therefore they should just suck, just it, up. suck it up, even though they themselves are on a public wage, as I am. But on the other hand, I, I think hospitals that are um, actively involved in research should be putting posters up everywhere so that that first point of contact the patient has where they're finding out about the hospital's research is not when they're being expected to provide consent. It will be, you know, and I think it should be showcased. I know I'm going to <clears throat> give Townsville a plug here, but they used to really showcase their research and have, have posters up and, you know, their Facebook site. So I think then if I am a patient presenting at, at a hospital, I am familiar with the fact that it's a teaching and research yeah. hospital and that I might be approached. I think that's a really mm. good and good not way approached to go about by it. my clinician, approached yeah. by somebody else. Yeah. It's not as intimidating. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think I mean thank you, Nicole. I think that, that's useful because I was sort of getting more at like the charter of patient rights as opposed to the PICF. 
because quite frankly, the PICF is sort of too late. And I think understanding what your abilities are before you get into research is probably more important, at least so you're aware of where you can go if there are any problems. So we'll just move on with a couple of questions, some really good questions. Uh, one from Ben Canny, who's a chairperson of one of the Bilbury HREX. Um, question for the panel, especially the investigators. Were there, in retrospect, hints from previous activities or behaviours that indicated a history of dishonest behaviours? And I think that's one of the cases you were mentioning earlier on. I think uh, from what I understand about the, the Murdoch Barwood case, once they reviewed a number of the other papers they'd submitted, they found not dissimilar type of fraud and they were charged with that as well. So uh, no surprises. What I was saying before about the, the arrogance and the blatantness of the brazenness of the conduct did tend to suggest that uh, this wasn't a one-off and that it had been a pattern of behaviour engaged in because they were getting away with it, particularly the, the professor. So yes, I think uh, regrettably that was the pattern. Yeah, was he doing right. it with this particular researcher? Was there no, a personal relationship? She was brought into it, I think, on that that occasion. She Just hadn't been with him on the others, I don't think. No, I'm sorry to say, yeah. She she wasn't uh, involved with the earlier cases, as far as I remember. I think she was mainly involved in this one. But he, yeah, it was the. He said the, she was co-author, yeah. and she accepted that. Yeah. yeah so so, so he already had was a personal relationship between the two of them that was the nexus of the. No, of the he, do, he was already behaving in a particular in way, way. Yeah. and then I guess she was drawn into it. it. And there was evidence of that, and it unfortunately played out in court, in the you know, public court. So. Because mm. um, yeah. sometimes these things are championing, championing somebody yeah. rather than yeah. yeah. So just with that slippery slope, does someone suddenly start behaving in an unusual way, or is it that they've built up a pattern and, and are slowly becoming more confident in what they do? Yeah. And it would probably turn on the different circumstances yeah. and the different personalities. Oh, Gordon, what became evident in in this particular case was that some papers which never never got published um, because they were the authors were someone else in a junior category suddenly got published with um, professor murdoch's name on them and some people weren't aware until it was pointed out to them that that was one of their papers yeah oh wow. yeah well that's so, a straight plagiarism yeah. so these these are these are the red flags that you know institutions that you know do research should should be very cautious about and conscious of Oh, look, David, no, no doubt you're right, but you can foresee a situation where sometimes you don't know something has happened until something hits the fan, and mm -hmm. it's incredibly mm -hmm. difficult, and you have to be rather forensic in your auditing to determine whether someone is conducting research accordingly, even yeah. if you have a monitoring and auditing capability at your university stroke hospital, unless you know your stuff, it can be very difficult until the data comes out, so... Um, you know, you can only do what you can do, but sometimes it must be very difficult to detect. Yeah, um, so that's, why, that's why the report is so important, I think, uh, Gordon. That's why that cultural aspect is so important to have people just alert to yeah. what, what may not be right or not you know, mm. and talk about it. Yeah. Be alert, not alarmed. Very good. Um, I was going to say, and it's not uncommon as well, and I've certainly was made aware of it when I was an ATREC chair, and that was where, you know, a well wrote known researcher will Google themselves and suddenly find out that their name's been put on papers that they <laughs> had no knowledge of. So because it was this thought that the publishers were are more likely to, to publish if they've got someone sort of famous on board. So that's not, not an uncommon scenario too. Yeah. And, you know, there's evidence as well that some, um, uh, some publications are a little bit predatory. Yeah. So, you know, their standards are not the same and um, they are very happy to take papers with questionable authorship. In other words, not peer reviewed. Yes. Um, okay, this is from anonymous attendee. Is there a conflict of interest in having research integrity report to the DVCR when DVCR success is based on quantity of research and funding of research? Should research integrity report directly to a separate integrity department in the university? Oh, that's a very good question. And uh, I can tell you now that I don't have an easy answer for that. But I can tell you that um, uh, the university has taken conflicts of interest um, extremely seriously, and particularly in the space of the commercialization of research. Uh, to give you an example, um, in the last 12 months, the university has self-developed four online disclosure registers for conflicts of interest, secondary employment, sensitive research, and uh, foreign um, influence. 
uh, and it's mandatory for all staff at uh, certain levels, uh, mandatory annually, and it's also partnered up with um, uh, training. However, as to where uh, that sits, um, I can see the rationale for it sitting there because it's obviously part of the, the entire body of work of research. Um, I guess we'd have to have a case to discuss as to whether or not that's created you know, attention. Really, really, basically, that's going to depend on the culture because if you mm. don't have a culture of honesty and openness, <clears> then <throat> no one's going to fill your register in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm. Look, I think it does go back to, I think, as I mentioned earlier, UQ um, to sucking it up and actually coming forward with the fact there had been research misconduct, their mm. level of integrity at the top was clearly, you know, appropriate. So I, I understand your point, David, but um, obviously one has to report somewhere and I think uh, the DVCR is probably as good as any, quite frankly. Mm. Um, so Susan, just to, sorry to take you back to, to your talk, um, but this is a, a question that came in uh, after the talk. Thank you mm. for a great talk. Are you able to advise how your comments around consent with research in the emergency setting where the potential participant may be affected by drugs or alcohol? Well, we all know that you can't get retrospective consent. So there's your first starting point. Um, if you, if, and it's funny, um, my, well, again, without talking out of school, my Hatrex spent probably about a good hour and a half on this just recently. Um, um, and I think the consensus view that we reached was that you're, in an emergency, well, first of all, the act says that in an emergency, a doctor doesn't need consent to do anything, they just do it. So if you're talking golden hours and all the rest of it, then, you know, uh, as long as it's in line with good medical practice, you can just step in and do whatever you need to do. But in terms of research, if you're consenting someone who's coming into an ED and it takes another 30 seconds to say, oh, by the way, um, to whoever's with the person, we have this research project that we're doing on exactly this situation. We'd like to use your person, friend, relative. Um, you know, here's a 30 second blurb on what we're doing um, in very simple terms. Is it okay if we do it? Then you've probably got reasonable consent from, from because clearly the person's not going to be able to give consent themselves. If, however, none of those things are available, and I'm not suggesting for one minute you spend, you know, half an hour on the health line to the public guardian or longer in circumstances where you're time pressured, don't laugh, <laughs> um, then you you do it, you enrol them. You do it and afterwards you get consent to use their data. That's where we got to. So, um, uh, and any of my Hatrex colleagues, please chime in if you don't think I've got this right. But really, we saw consent as a two-step process. Um, was the okay? We can't get consent to enrol them. We're just going to do it because we're looking at this drug, and um, we've only got ten minutes to give it to them, and there's no one around who's going to be able to give consent. So we do it. As long again, it's got to be in line with good medical practice. Mm. Um, but assuming that that's the case, then the second part of the the, well, the second part of getting consent is to say to someone at a later point, look, this is what we did. We would like to use your data in our research. Will you consent to that? Because you can't get retrospective consent with something you've already done. Now that's where we got to, but that's just our mm -hmm. view of the answer to that question, Gordon, so. And I was gonna say, it depends on the type of clinical research. So if you're comparing two conventional treatments, just say, oral paracetamol tablets versus oral paracetamol liquid or something like that, all similar, then it's a very different story than if you're trying to recruit people to a phase one study, um, which has very, very different risks and yes. is not for the benefit of the patient. And in fact, the ones. legislation covers that because yeah. it says a comparison a comparison, comparison. comparison of, of two already approved things is, is actually not clinical research yeah, that you get yeah. interested in. So yeah. your expression is Susan, known to be beneficial. Both 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 treatments have to be known to be beneficial. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes what comes up is um, again, there was one just recently, I think, where it was a drug use, a, a, an approved drug used for something, but they thought it might be good for something. A bit of that coming up with the COVID stuff um, at the moment, you know, people are trying different things. So it's an approved drug. Um, 
you know, it's known to be beneficial, but um, and they want to use it to try in a different context yeah, in a different for a different context. disease. Yeah. Oh yes, I think it's anti-malaria agent yeah. or the All disinfectant of the of the Trump talks about. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the metro south is one come up, come to, is, is a very common one, rather not common, but one I think most hospital HRECs face on a regular basis. And I know that our HREC, and you know that our HREC has, has dealt with this one reasonably recently and, and believe the same thing, a two-step process sometimes has to be the way forward. Oh, well, I'm pleased you agree with this, Gordon. <laughs> well, you're the expert, Susan. Um, okay, so next question from anonymous attendee again. Fraudulent behavior is one extreme end of the research misconduct scale. What kind of advice would you give to HRECs about handling research misconduct that is simply a breach of the code or policy, noting that the HREC is guided and confined to the national statement and not the institution's codes or policies? Well, do you know, and I, I was very fortunate because I always worked with great people um, like Sue Jenkins Marsh. <laughs> and so, Sarah Potts online. Sarah Potts is online, thank you. And thank you for the comment about my hair, Sarah. <laughs> Um, who just sent me a message to say it looked fabulous. Yes, it does. Thank you. Um, no, I was going to say that. Um, I, I always found if I had a, was in a bit of a pickle, the chances are if it breached their HREC agreement, it was going to be breaching the governance agreement for the particular institution. So the best thing if you're a HREC chair or an HREC is to draw on the knowledge um, of, that, of that person and draw on the knowledge of your ATREC. So the ATREC would always be involved and we would keep them informed of anything that was happening. So I've probably come from a position where I've been very spoiled because I, I did have access to people with sort of knowledge and expertise and how I should manage things. And how many applications per meeting did you have? Oh, uh, we had, oh, I can't tell you in total. I actually can't tell you in total, I can't remember. It was a while ago, yeah. Okay. But we next, report against them in the ATREC meeting. Yeah. Uh, next one, does the panel have any view on the pathway of assessment of a potential breach that aligns with the code? So this question is really about the differences, I think, in assessment methodology. Some universities may have matters referred to the head of school to do the initial assessment, seeing it as a staff management issue. Others may have the research integrity office do the initial assessment. Uh, and the preliminary assessment and not involve the management area. So probably one for you, David. So it's basically different methodology. What do you reckon? Should, should they all be the same or, you know, is it horses for courses? Yeah. Well, we, we have a, um, an Office of Research Integrity. It would be a great question for either Dr. Sue O'Brien or Dr. Mark Campke to answer that question, but I can say something to it. In each of the faculties and institutes at the University of Queensland, there's people who perform a role of a Research Integrity Advisor, no doubt familiar to people listening in. And their role is to give advice. They don't investigate, um, but they can seek advice themselves and they help the, any researchers who may have a question about concerning behaviours such as research misconduct, plagiarism, fraudulent data, whatever it might be. Uh, and then they can communicate directly with the Office of Research Integrity. That's where the actual assessment will be done. And from that point, it'll be an escalator depending on the severity of it. For example, we're on the same floor of the same building. So they use our assessment tools uh, to try and figure out whether or not it's a corrupt conduct matter. And then we talk about those matters together. Um, and I think that's a good system. And I think if I, if I can just add, Gordon, that just uh, it's not dissimilar to what we do at our place. The most important part of the process, frankly, where you need your best people is in the triaging of all complaints. Because often something might look innocuous on the face of it, mm -hmm. but with experienced people, It'll be a flag that's more serious. You need to look more closely and give it to other people. So you just need to be very careful how, how complaints are assessed, in my view, and you need your best people doing that in, in a consistent way so that nothing slips under the radar. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a couple more questions, Gordon. Yep, just a couple more. Um, does the panel have a view on the well overdue need for a National Office of Research Integrity? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, okay. well, we have a shared we yeah, have a shared view. Absolutely. Yes, we absolutely we're very wide that. ranging powers. <laughs> yes, yes. Fair enough. Not <laughs> well, well actually maybe I could maybe I could ask Ellen a question about your views on the, the potential national crime commission. Yeah. Well, that'd be the integrity commission. Yeah, yeah. Anyone anyone that 
suggest, and there are many who have money politicians, to suggest there's not a need for one, uh, it's an absurd argument, frankly. Yeah, it I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer. The sort of money that the Commonwealth deals with, the procurement contracts, defence contracts. Land, 30 yes. million when it's 3 million. <laughs> Sports, rorts, you name it, it's all happening in the Commonwealth sphere and there's no integrity commission. And the one they propose, uh, surprise, surprise, seems good. to carve out the uh, yeah. powers that apply to politicians as opposed to federal public servants and yeah. federal police. It's a bit of a lame duck. So that's an ongoing conversation which I'm heavily involved in, I might say, and um, we're hoping to get some traction, have something done about it, because I think the model of the independent um, Heather Haynes, I think her name is, mm -hmm. who's um, produced, similar to the Catherine McGowan's bill some years ago, is a very good model, it has all the, the, the elements that need to be there, and there's no reason why federal research um, shouldn't be part of that whole equation as corrupt conduct occurs, similar to what happened in the UQ mm. example we talked about. I think there will be a public release of the, the research report that was undertaken by Transparency International mm. and AJ Brown yep. uh, that our agencies also funded and that is coming up very, I think it's within days. Next week, yeah. I know it's in my diary somewhere. So if anyone's interested in that, obviously there's been submissions, public submissions made and you can have a look at that report release next week. And I'm sure you can even log in because they're sort of doing a spending one hour going. But you know, like, neither of you are allowed to go across the border, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> we, went to, we went to Adelaide. Yeah. You know, literally, I've, I've been you know, don't tested. get news about shifting down south to a national body or anything, will you? <laughs> we will declare we were in Adelaide on the Thursday, but the cutoff was we're the Monday. We're locking you up here. Yes. We're, we're um, Alan, maybe, maybe a question for you. Just, well, obviously the Crime Commission has a certain mandate uh, in, in, in Queensland. Um, do your counterparts in other states have similar mandates that relate to their uh, universities and hospitals? Yeah, by and large, uh, Gordon, um, the, the jurisdiction is, is roughly similar. Uh, there, are, there are nuances, but uh, generally speaking, universities and this sort of behaviour will be covered by most of my counterparts in the other states, yeah. Okay, and maybe a final question, Nicola. Um, how do we move forward if even in this instance, the research perspectives is seemingly defensive or excusing cases and precedents that points to clear misconduct and redundancy due to lack of ethical regard. Surely the legal perspective is clearly indicative of a proportion of researchers or individuals willing to do wrong. So the focus must be mandating better culture. Look, I, I think it's really simple and it's and it's coming from someone with a with a law degree and mm. trained as an ethicist, obviously um, in Victoria and I've also worked in that capacity in Queensland before this job. It's really simple. You just have to face it focus on the research participants and what's right for them. Where you see misconduct or indeed anything that goes wrong with the research, it's usually because the researcher focuses on their own interest, whether they need a publication to keep their job or they need a publication to get um, more money in, or they're spending it in a particular way that they can't justify it. I think if we focus, if, if each individual thinks about what it means to the participant and puts their interests first, I think that sort of completely changes your perspective. It's not hard to do in the health setting because most people become clinicians uh, and health professionals because they have a focus on, on helping people. And I think that we get in our own way when we start worrying about what something might mean to us, whether it's not enough publications, not enough money, you know, not going from associate professor to professor, etc. So that would be my my step is just focus on the research participants and why you're really there. And I, my, my plug would be to read the Queensland Human Rights Act. Or, or the other, or some of the jurisdictions don't have Human Rights Act yet, but we all know human rights more broadly anyway. I think your, your question, uh, uh, Gordon, is right on the money. It all comes back to culture, which is what uh, Nicole has been saying. People have to understand that they're not, it's not their self-interest that's important, it's the public interest in the, um, in the research that's being done and so on. And maybe the first point falls back to the hatred. Yep, yeah. absolutely. And for those institutions that do research, be proud, put those flyers up. Don't let it be that the first time a person on your premises hears that you do research is when someone's trying to enrol them. Put everything, showcase it, make it well known so that people have an expectation that they might be approached and they can sort of factor that in. Mm. 
before before they're approached for the first time, often when they're not in a very good state. So they're sitting in a in a in a waiting room and they're looking at the posters that are around and yeah. reading them. Yeah. yeah. And make that link back. That's how we decide how to give patient care. It's because of the research. Mm. So, yeah. so Nicola, those are the end of the questions. Um, I wonder if you any of you might wish to make some summary comments for ethics committees noting that this is a, an ethics committee training conference and perhaps some tips for them. I could offer something. Um, I'm very passionate about um, conflicts of interest being explored, disclosed and managed. And it's so um, um, enjoyable to hear people in the University of Queensland talking about conflicts of interest as part of normal conversation. Uh, and I think if we could all start thinking about ethics, whether it be HREC discussions or other, in normal conversations, then we'll be all better for it. Now, if I could just add to that, uh, Gordon, I think that's exactly right. And I think one of the keys to that is that people with the best of intentions have a, have a tendency to say, look, I know I've done nothing wrong, so all this nonsense about conflicts of interest doesn't really apply to me because I, I'm honest. The, 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 the need is to change the mindset, just a fraction, to have them thinking, what if someone who didn't know me, what would they think about this conduct and how can I protect myself from the perception that I've done something wrong? And if you have that slightly different mindset, you can't go wrong. If you document the good reasons why you've done something, you declare a conflict, you manage it, don't be afraid of it. It's not, don't overthink it. Just do what's right. S Susan, anything from yourself? No, just 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 to say that I stand in awe of most of the colleagues that I sit around the table with once a month, even if it is by Zoom. Um, <laughs> um, and and the, the the reason that I do it every month is the absolute interest that I have in the work that these people do, and I just would commend that to everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Nicola, some final words from yourself, and then we might uh, finish this session. Well, I don't think I could top what these three have said. <laughs> Just a huge thank you today to Susan, Alan, and David for joining us. I think it, hopefully we've covered covered the whole range of, of, of issues that people might see, and um, we hope people have found it useful. Well, thank you. I mean, there has been a lot of uh, chat in the in the chat room, just uh, in, in general terms, and I think it has stimulated some some lively discussion. Um, for the most part, very very supportive, and I don't mean it wasn't supportive. It's just that uh, I think it's just generated some questions which aren't necessarily always answerable, at least not in this forum. So, what I might do then is thank uh, yourself, Nicola. Alan, Susan and David for a, um, a wonderful, stimulating um, and to use your terms, Nicola Walk presentation uh, on research ethics, integrity and the role of QCAT in consent. Thank you very much. Bye. Enjoy Bye. the rest of the day, everyone.